welcome back to another edition of the Prepper Recon Podcast. Our mission is to bring you great interviews with preppers from around the world so you can be better informed and better prepared for everything from a hurricane to the end of the world as we know it. I've been purchasing gold and silver from JM Bullion since before they were a show sponsor because they have the lowest price of any dealer I know of. JM Bullion now offers free shipping on all orders. Check them out online today at jmbullion.com. I put together a compact individual first aid kit or IFAC that's perfect for gunshot wounds, car accidents, and other traumatic injuries. It's a Molly compatible pouch in Coyote, ACU, or Black. It's equipped with an Israeli battle dressing, quick clot, an Asherman chest seal, nasopharyngeal airway, a TK4 tourniquet, three pre-threaded nylon sutures, EMT shears, betadine swabs, steri strips, and lots of extras. It's perfect for your glove box, bug out bag, or home first aid kit. Go to the PrepperRecon.com homepage and click on the IFAC store tab at the top of the page. $99 includes shipping and this kit could save your life. Today's guest is Oath Keeper John Mack. John, thanks for coming on the show. Well, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for for this. Oh, absolutely. It's a, it's a pleasure to have you on. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, yes. Uh, um, I grew up in a, a Navy family, and uh, and after finishing up college in uh, architecture, I joined the Navy myself and had a chance to fly helicopters. Uh, and it was uh, a lot of stories to tell. Um and, uh, but after 10 years in the regular Navy, I decided to get out and get back into my, uh, occupation that I went to college for, which was, uh, architecture. And, but I stayed in the Navy Reserve. So I ended up retiring out of the Navy after 20 years, um, and finished up, uh, doing the architecture thing. And now I'm kind of semi-retired a little early, but with the economy the way it is, uh, the housing market isn't the greatest place to be in these days. So, uh, but I, uh, I'm still still doing it part time and uh, enjoying enjoying the semi retirement. Oh, that's cool! And I, I don't know of any man in the world that has never dreamed of being a helicopter pilot at some point in their life. <laughs> that's that's a pretty cool uh, thing to have on your resume. Well, let me tell you, in uh, in naval aviation uh, uh, the, uh, training, man, how it. Everybody was trying to get jets. Everybody wanted to fly Tom Tomcats when I was uh, in flight school, and they all were just like they'd already gotten that far. They'd already gotten into flight school, and when you get into flight school, you everybody trains in the same uh, turboprop, and then at, after a certain point, then you either pick jets, props, or helos, as we call them in the Navy. And believe me, nobody wanted to fly helos, but. Uh, you know, you're already there. You're already that point, and everybody wanted to be Tom Cruise, of course. So, uh, so anyway, but it's so it's funny you say that. Uh, all my uh, friends are going like, "No, not heroes," but I love them. Wow, I, I just think it's the, the wor- coolest thing in the world. Yeah, the world looks great at 500 feet. Absolutely, and and, now- and we can tell that from all the drones that are flying over these days. <laughs> yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> I can pretty much log on to Google and watch myself uh, cutting my own grass. You know, it's, uh, exactly. it's, it's pretty scary, isn't it? <laughs> it is, isn't it? Now, uh, when did you first get involved with uh, Oath Keepers? Well, I, in 2009, Oath Keepers was founded in April on April 19th of 2009, and uh, Stuart Rose, our founder, was living in Las Vegas at the time, taking care of his mother who was dying of cancer. And he had a con- uh, con- conference in October of 2009, and it made the paper, and that's where I first heard about Oath Keepers. And so I went to the conference in the two-day affair, and uh, I was just really impressed by the, the mission and the people that were representing Oath Keepers at, at this particular conference. So that's how I got started. And then uh, April 19th is, uh, happens to be the anniversary of Lexington and, and Concord as well. So that's a, that's a very uh, neat little side fact that uh, Oath Keepers was founded on, this, on the anniversary of Lexington and Concord. Yes, and that was on purpose because if, for those of you who know the history of Lexington and Concord, know that the British were on their way to Concord to confiscate weapons, and uh, which, of course, is 
in our, our world today is a direct violation of the Second Amendment. So Oath Keepers being uh, really uh, interested in the Bill of Rights and and making sure we that they're enforced the way the Founding Fathers had written them, uh, with that it was a particularly important date, and so they specifically used April 19th as their founding. And then the, the border of Connecticut is only about uh, 50 miles away from Lexington and Concord, and uh, we're basically seeing the same type of thing happen again with the gun registration, and we're hearing a lot of uh, very negative rhetoric uh, from from uh, Connecticut about the people that have refused to register their firearms there. Yes, and, uh, you know, registration is the first step towards confiscation. You can ask any Canadian. Uh, they had to register all their their uh, weapons, and uh, then um, a couple of years ago, they uh, the legislature decided that they didn't want this style of weapon uh, allowed anymore. So they they looked up on the registration and went to everybody's house who had that kind of weapon and confiscated those weapons. So it's just the first step towards confiscation. Now, can you give us a little uh, brief overview of what Oath Keepers is and, and what they stand for? Yes, we are an association of military, police, firefighters, and first responders. Also, uh, we call them civilian, people who haven't participated in any of those occupations, who are interested in both veterans and current servers. And But we're reaching out to the current servers to make sure they understand the Constitution so that they don't inadvertently enforce an unconstitutional order. Now, don't military and law enforcement already take an oath to uphold the Constitution? Yes, and that's the oath that we, that when we say oath keepers, that is specifically the oath that we're referring to. Um, all all uh, military and police take that. Most firefighters do even when first responders do in, in many cases. Of course, lawyers and politicians also take that oath. But uh, we're interested in the, the people who are um, on the beat, carrying the, uh, enforcing the law, and the military who are out in the field enforcing uh, or, or protecting the laws that uh, we're specifically addressing. And, John, is there a specific list of things that Oath Keepers has pledged that they won't do or, or uh, something that they would stand down if they were to have uh, certain types of orders given? Yes, and, in fact, that's where we got our start and got some notoriety because we uh, basically have ten, we have ten orders we will not obey. And, in fact, if you look at one of our logos that has the Minuteman, there's a number 10 next to him, and that's standing for the ten orders we will not obey. And those 10 orders are all based on the Bill of Rights and also on the history. All of those orders have been given in our history, sometimes by the British during the Revolution, but other times by our own government. And so uh, basically we wanted to make sure that the policemen and the, and the military guys under uh, thought about orders that they could possibly receive in the future and so they could come up with a response or try to figure out exactly what they would do in case they ever received an order like that. And there's 10 of them that we came up with. Can you list those 10 for us? Uh, yeah, I'll try to do it quickly. The first one, these are all, we will not obey orders to disarm the American people. We will not obey orders to, to conduct warrantless, warrantless searches of the American people. We will not obey orders to detain American citizens as quote, unlawful enemy combatants, unquote, or subject them to military tribunal. We will not obey orders to impose martial law or a, quote, state of emergency, unquote, on a state. Do any of these sound familiar so far? We a will a not couple obey, of them do. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we will not obey orders to invade or subjugate any state that asserts its sovereignty. We will not obey any order to blockade American cities, thus t- turning them into giant concentration camps. We will not obey any orders to force American citizens into any form of detention camps under any pretext. We will not obey orders to assist or support the use of any foreign troops on U.S. soil against American people to, quote, keep the peace, unquote, or to, quote, maintain control, unquote. We 
will not any obey any order to confiscate the property of the American people, including food and other essential supplies. And lastly, we will not obey any order with which infringe on the rights of the people to free speech, to peaceably assemble, and to petition their government for the redress of grievances. Now, all of those sound like things that, that should be protected by the Constitution that we would never have to worry about, but uh, just our recent news cycles have told us that we do have to worry about a lot of those things. Now, for the average citizen, if you find out you're working for a corrupt organization, you need to get out of there or you're at risk of being charged under the RICO Act. You might not be doing anything that's inherently evil, but let's say you're the receptionist for a mob boss. If you know you're involved with a corrupt organization, you could be charged under RICO. Now, from a moral standpoint, is there a point that an officer or a soldier needs to lay down their badge or uh, or leave that, that organization if, if they find out that their department or their branch of the military has been, become corrupt? Well, yes, we would, we would assume that the, that a law-abiding and God-fearing person in the United States would, would have that, that moral fortitude to, to uh, leave an organization that was doing illegal activity or to help pull a spotlight onto an organization that was doing, uh, illegal activity such as, uh, um, you know, such as being a whistleblower, for example. Um, so yes, we would we would hope that those that that would happen. Of course, the reality is that um, that we now have professional military and professional police forces, as well as professional firefighters, and so there is a lot more to lose if they quit their job or or do whistleblowing activities. And so it 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 since it's their means of of uh, you know their occupation and you know their means of supporting their families, it makes it much more difficult for them to make that quote moral decision unquote. Now, would you classify the actions of the agencies that were uh, involved in performing the house to house raids in Watertown after the Boston bombing? Do you think those those activities were illegal? Well, I have not seen a warrant. And so I don't know if any warrant was issued. I don't know if a blanket warrant was issued. But um, for over a thousand years, English law has had the castle doctrine, which was basically set up to keep the king and his men from just walking into your house and doing whatever they wanted to do in your house. And so for a thousand years, that has been part of English law, which of course means it's, it's the American heritage. And for a town to just say, okay, we've got this, this mad bomber on the loose, and he, yes, he was a terrible guy, but to just be able to walk into everybody's house in Watertown, Massachusetts, is against the whole idea of the, of the castle doctrine. And, um, but of course people can allow the police to come into their house. That's fine. Uh, if you watch some of the video that was on YouTube, there are some people who were marched out of their houses with their hands above their heads, including children. And I don't know for sure if it's these people who refuse to allow the police into their house to search without a warrant or exactly what was up with these people being marched out of the house. But there's at least three or four different um, uh, incidences that were shown on video. And it just makes you wonder exactly what happened. You know, it's just like, uh, you know, you hear about all the stupid criminals who, who uh, get stopped and uh, for a traffic, minor traffic violation, and they allow the police to search the car, and, and they find something, and then they get arrested. Well... You know, you go like, well, if you thought you had something in your house, then why in the heck would you allow them to search? Well, people are just sort of uh, intimidated by the police and also um, are kind of in the mindset of this is what is supposed to happen. But this is exactly what is not supposed to happen. You're supposed to be protected in your persons, places, houses, and effects. 
and then against unreasonable against unreasonable searches. Right, and then after they were brought out of their homes uh, at gunpoint and uh, walked down the the street with their hands on their heads, they were frisked as if they were some type of criminal that was uh, that was being arrested. I mean, I would have thought that if there were ever a, a day in our history that you wanted your citizenry to be armed, maybe that would have been a good day for them to have had their own weapon to to defend themselves. Well, this is exactly the point. Um, the, we have the Bill of Rights, and, you know, every one of my, this is a little hint to your uh, listeners, at, at just about every one of my um, events where I talk about the Constitution, I ask everybody, what are the five freedoms that are listed in the First Amendment? I will give away a free Oath Keeper t-shirt to anyone who can tell me the five freedoms that are listed in the First Amendment, and I have never given away a t-shirt. Uh, people don't know their Bill of Rights. I mean, it, it, most people can come up with religion or freedom of speech, sometimes freedom of press, but, man, I hardly find anyone who can find the last two, but generally as a group, they figure it all out. But they don't know the Bill of Rights, but that's because you don't think about it. Um, I'm assuming that you're not currently under arrest for murder. Um, so you know that there are a bunch of protections out there, mostly because you've watched television and you've heard people been re- having their Miranda rights read. And, of course, the Miranda rights were borrowed from the 5th, 6th, and 7th Amendment. And um, so it's not a big deal to you because you're currently not under arrest. But if you got arrested for murder tomorrow, boy, you would immediately want to know who your accuser is, um, what exactly the charges are, um, and making sure that you're going to get a speedy and fair trial by your peers in the area that you live in, because these are now important to you. You are under stress, and these things are important to you. So the Bill of Rights was written for times of stress, and that applies to all ten of them, not just um, the fifth, sixth, and seventh, which deal with trials. Um, for example, um, uh, Stuart Rhodes famously appeared on the O'Reilly Factor back in 20, in 2010. And they got into this gun confiscation deal and, and, uh, and, um, O'Reilly kept saying, but it was martial, it was a natural emergency. They were under martial law. And, and Stuart says, you know, was arguing back and forth that that doesn't give them a right to, to suspend the Bill of Rights. And finally, Stuart said, so, you're going to suspend the Bill of Rights because of bad weather? And that's a funny line, but it's exactly true. It's under times of stress when the Bill of Rights become absolutely important. I just had that clip on my website maybe about three or four weeks ago, actually. And uh, it was uh, the, if anybody that wants to go back and look look through the archives i think the the title was patriot or pinhead <laughs> which uh you know i think that it's obvious that uh that bill o'reilly proved himself to be a pinhead in that particular interview but you know he has the number one most watched cable news show in america and he is on the channel that puts itself out as being the conservative uh alternative to all of the the liberal stuff that that we're supposed to be fighting against he's supposed to be one of the good guys and he has no clue whatsoever i think that's very very disturbing to me uh as an american uh it is you know and i don't know uh you know bill riley riley is more of a populist most people think he's a conservative but he's really a populist and he grew up in new york and went to college um, I know he went to Harvard. I don't know where else he went. And um, it's a different mindset uh, in people who grew up in, you know, well, as opposed to being out in the West or out or down South, where hunting and fishing are part of your lifestyle and uh, owning a gun or seeing a gun um, isn't a big deal. And I think for Bill O'Reilly, it's probably a bigger deal because he wasn't, didn't have that exposure that, um, that people outside of big cities are used to. Of course, now, now uh, in, in some big cities like Chicago, you are exposed to gunfire a lot. But, uh, 
anyway, I don't know if that's the reason why he is like, well, it's the police, it's the martial law, that, then everything is fine. You can go ahead and suspend the, uh, the, the Bill of Rights. I had a, a discussion with an Air Force officer one day at a gun show. And, uh, and I talked about the Constitution. He's all I know about the Constitution. And I, so, so, but he was, um, um, uh, so he said he, he knew, you know, he, he didn't need to read the Ten Orders because he knew about the Constitution. And so, um, he said they don't follow it anyway. And I said, that's true. I said, like martial law. And he goes, well, no, martial law is necessary. And I said to him, I said, uh, where is martial law in the Constitution? He says, oh, well, I don't think it's in the Constitution, but it doesn't matter. And I said, well, what is the purpose of martial law? And he said, security. Yeah, I mean, he really walked right into this. He said, security. And I said, yes, exactly. And where is the only time security is mentioned in the Constitution? And he scratched his head and looked at me. And I said, the Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state. Uh, the right to bear arms shall not be infringed. And he looked at me, and it's like a light bulb went on. And uh, it's up to us to uh, to keep our community secure. It's not up to um, a uh, a police force, especially one that's from outside your community, to declare martial law so that they can manage up manage all of us. And then the the primary conversation that that Stewart and Bill were having in that clip was uh, was about the the house to house gun confiscations after Hurricane Katrina. Now, do you think all of the officers that participated in that were they all jack booted thugs, or do you think some of those officers might have been good guys uh, that had just never taken the time to think about what they would do if they were put in that? position of having to ask people to surrender their weapons uh you know maybe they were good guys but they looked to the left and they looked to the right and everybody else was doing it so they just kind of went along to get along they volunteered most most of them volunteered if you remember the uh, new orleans police force got overworked real fast and uh and they had real problems so they had to bring in people from all over and people volunteered to do that and, um, you know, I admire them coming in to try to help, help the city. They didn't under, you know, but they're from outside. They're outsiders. And so they didn't understand the situation. Um, and they, you know, they were there to help. So they're going to, of course, follow orders, uh, because that's why they're there. And so when the chief of police in New Orleans, uh, ordered, um, to confiscate all weapons, they just went house to house and they didn't, you know, and, and these are, basically good moral men and women, but at the same time, they're from out of the area. And and uh, that famous clip where the two uh, police officers or one police officer sort of wrestled that revolver away from the old lady in the kitchen, um, you know, if you look carefully or somebody told me that those are highway patrolmen, well, they're there for a couple of weeks. Um, they're never going to see this lady again. They're just following orders, and they're going to go back to California. It's like no skin off their nose. And, you know, and it, it's disheartening to see these people do this, but you can kind of understand the situation. And, and in fact, that's why central government is so successful at um, – a centralized government is so successful at, at – um, Taking away people's rights is because they specifically. I mean, if you look at what what uh, Stalin did, you know, he specifically moves people to places outside of their village or their city so that they don't care as much about what they do to the locals. So it's just a it's just a human nature. And of course, we're glad that cooler heads prevailed in that situation. But if that old lady would have sent those gentlemen back to California in a box. She would have been very well justified in her actions uh, morally and constitutionally. Is that correct? Well, I don't want to go there. <laughs> okay, I got gotcha. you. Now, uh, would you, you know? Sure, absolutely. We just we always hope nothing like that will ever happen. But uh, would you encourage soldiers and law enforcement 
to live on a budget so they can reduce debt and start a savings fund in case they ever lose their job over refusing an unconstitutional order? You know, that's a, uh, that's a very interesting question. Uh, one of those things that you go like, whoa, kind of type thing. But, of course, all of us should be on a budget so that we can have that rainy day fund, that emergency stash uh, that we can fall back on. I mean, that's what health, that's what the uh, health savings accounts are all supposed to be about. And that would solve most of our health care problems if, we, if everybody would do that. And if you have to force people to do that, uh, then it's, it's not the, the, not the uh, uh, free market system. But unfortunately, uh, we are not very well, very disciplined with this. And um, yeah, you know, I, I a, a, a policeman uh, or a guy in the military, like all of us, should always be ready to resign our position in case of, of you know, in some immoral activity, activity that we don't have any choice in in changing. And probably now more than ever since we see the, the, the incidents that, uh, you know, maybe some of the, the folks in Watertown should have uh, just turned in their badge and, and refused to do some of those things. And, you know, maybe if they'd have been in a better financial position, perhaps uh, some of them would have chose to do that. And, and a lot of times when you see one or two guys stand up and do the right thing, then uh, it's easier for everybody else to sort of fall in behind them. And, and, and that's sort of what we need and, to. And that's, and that's, but I, I, I'm going to object to what you just said. Do the right thing. Because that is exactly what we are not about. We are a nation of laws, not a, a nation of notions. And there's a famous uh, YouTube video where a, um, uh, this is right when the Tea Party became uh, big at the, and, there, and all these people were coming, all these congressmen were coming back to their districts for town hall meetings. And someone in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, or whatever, some congressman came back and they were saying, where in the Constitution does it say we can, uh, that, that Congress is supposed to dictate health care and charge us for it? And he said, I don't care about the Constitution. I want to do the right thing. So, so that's why I objected to what you said, because that the right thing is not the constitutional thing in all cases. But that's what law is about. Law is about sorting out those kinds of problems. And um, we all have ideas of what the right thing to do is. Um, for some politicians, it's, it's taking money from others to, to help other people. And, you know, and you can go through all of these, uh, 10 orders, for example, and try to figure out what the right thing to do is, but it's the constitutional thing, which is important. Right. And you have to be, and sometimes it's going to cost you to do the constitutional thing. Yes. Now, does uh, Oath Keepers have any type of fun that helps out if uh, something like that happens, if a, if a police officer uh, turns in his badge because he refuses to follow a unconstitutional order? No, we do not. Uh, we uh, on on some um, some well, like on the Bundy Ranch uh, thing, we did have a donation button for people who wanted to go to help out um, at the Bundy Ranch but weren't able to, and so they uh, you know they could donate. Um, in Quartzsite, uh, Arizona, a couple of years ago, the entire police force or 12, I think, on the police force, uh, 10 of the 12 um, resigned in protest because they didn't like what the chief of police of Quartzsite was doing. There was lots of corruption going on. Um, a new mayor had been elected by a fluke, and he was digging into what the city council was doing, and, uh, and so they, so what they did, so what the city council did is they, um, uh, they voted to not allow him to look at any of the financial records, and the police and the chief of police was right in there with, uh, uh, you know, with the, the the good boy, you know, with the good old boy network kind of type stuff. And finally, these uh, these, these deputies or or 
police officers um, had enough, and they all went on strike. Basically, or they all basically resigned their position, and we went down in support of them uh, to bring attention to them. And we did try to get uh, some state legislators involved because Quartzsite is kind of a remote location. It's definitely much bigger in the winter because of the sunbirds than it is in the, the summer when it's so darn hot so you can't stand it. But uh, anyway, so we went down in August and led a, a protest parade to try to gain attention. And there were some state legislatures that legislators that looked into some of the problems. Um, the the mayor that was trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, correct some of the stuff was defeated in an upcoming election. So and uh, and I'm not and and some of the police I think went back to work, but I don't know the full outcome of that. So there was some success, and there were some parts that didn't uh, didn't work out for you know the uh, the way things should be you know the transparency that was needed down there. And and for soldiers and law enforcement officers who may be hearing about Oath Keepers for the first time, uh, what can they do mm-hmm. and how can they sign up and how can they get involved? Well, they can go up the website, which is OathKeepers.org, and uh, and they can read about the ten orders and they can look at the uh, uh, you know the the uh, main part of the website and there's a a join and as I said, you don't have to have taken the oath professionally in order to join. You can join as an as an associate member to Oath Keepers. It's forty dollars a year, and um, um, it's you know, and then they can from there they can find their uh, local chapters. Some states are better organized than others, and some counties are better organized than others. In fact, you know, there's vast areas where we only have one or two people who are in Oath, oath Keepers, you know, and so it's frustrating for them because they can't uh, attend uh, meetings or get involved with the, with you know with other oath keepers but um, some states are, are pretty well organized John thank you very much for honoring your oath and thanks for all the work you're doing in oath keepers I think it might be the single most important work being done in the US today if we can't depend on our military and our law enforcement to uphold the Constitution I think probably all is lost and uh, we just Really don't have much left here is to make this country uh, the great country of America. And thanks for making time to come on today's show. Well, thank you very much. And I also want to thank all those uh, uh, current servers and the and the veterans out there for for the service they provided for our country. God bless you. And thank you for your service as well. Thank you. Hey, preppers and patriots, American Meltdown, the long-awaited sequel to American Exit Strategy, is now available in Kindle and paperback. In American Meltdown, book two of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, the new president, Anthony Howe, signs an executive order banning all semi-automatic weapons. Matt, Adam, and Wesley Baer begin training with their local militia for the battle that is coming. Within weeks of the inauguration, the $700 trillion derivatives bubble pops when rates on U.S. debt skyrocket. The derivatives crisis is the final nail in the coffin of the banking system and the death of the fiat currency system in America. With the dollar gone, commerce comes to a screeching halt. While times prove to be tough for all, survival favors the prepared. Get your Kindle or paperback copy of American Meltdown, book two of the Economic Collapse Chronicles, on Amazon today.